Uh, today, I will start by recapping the core of the argument, uh, the core of the, uh, uh, let's say, first third of the book, in terms of the uh, reasons for the relative <laughs> increase significance of social production in the network information economy. But then try to extend it to how we move from looking at the net as a unique place where something interesting is happening to generalizing from what we learn in the net about cooperative design to incorporating other sources of human behavioral studies into a general, into a general approach of cooperative human systems design uh, in the physical material world as well as online. And what I'll do tomorrow is uh, so today is very much in, in, in continuing the utopian um, 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 project. Uh, tomorrow, I'll do a bit more deeply materials uh, uh, that are more updated on uh, cultural participation and democratic participation that I worked in the middle half of the book um, uh, with newer work that I've done in, in terms of research since then but use it to explore the question that I have not, <coughs> that I've really glossed over in the past, which is the question of power and how these things can be described as changing or shifting the locus of power in ways that we can understand as normatively attractive under certain frameworks or at least that we can criticize under the norm. Yes. So those are the two things that I'm going to try to go and move beyond. Today is all uh, optimism, tomorrow is one half optimism and one half um, um, angst. Uh, so we'll see how it all plays out. Um, for a long time, we've had hobbyists doing all sorts of things that firms do. These hobbyists, these amateurs, these non-organized in firms or government structured producers, did not threaten, compete with, or displace in any way GM over the course of the 20th century for the primary reason that to shift from a nifty recreation of an electrical car to a production model that could seriously displace required massive capital investment in um, um, uh, assembly line. The same can't be said for this organization, Britannica, which had a pretty cool business model that included tagging very high status editors and contributors, binding contributors' uh, entries into a very uh, expensive uh, unit, and selling it for thousands of dollars as part of a general cultural practice of saying when you walk into a house with Britannica, you know you walk into a house where there's knowledge. Depending on a legal system based on copyright that allows the extraction of rents from this uh, model. Now, in 1999, two of the most sophisticated and interesting economists looking at information economics uh, started as the big new thing that digitization will do will be that Encarta will really compete with Britannica. Digitization lowered the costs, you could get a large company like Microsoft creating a competitor at lower cost, making it more attractive and usable, becoming essentially the Walmart to Britannica's uh, um, uh, wedge wood. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, what we saw was that Britannica had to come out and respond with a $500 uh, uh, model. And then, uh, shock of shock, a few years later, you could get it for $29.95 on buycheapsoftware.com. However, they completely missed, obviously, what we all today know as the genuine assault. Because when in February 2001, Jimmy Wales put 900 stubs on a platform that no one owned to a population in which no one was paid to write and no one was paid to edit, and anyone could change whatever they wanted, it was sheer nonsense, 
sheer nonsense to predict that four or five years later, the big brouhaha was better was whether the study that nature did of the quality of scientific articles in Wikipedia and scientific entries in Britannica was similar or alike, whether that study by nature was of sufficiently high quality when it said that they were both equally poor. Four and a half years later. Implausible, nonsensical, and yet she moves. So this is the basic question that needs to be asked. How is it that we have in this short period the development of a sophisticated, complex knowledge good by a widespread community of contributors, not through the market, not through an established hierarchical organizations, organizing to produce a measurably effective output of great social welfare. Um, and this becomes the anchor that's important, the equivalent story um, that has even more measurable in terms of its market output is uh, free software. So in 1996, two groups of software developers uh, decide that this new thing, the web, is at uh, 95, I'm sorry, this new thing, the web, is really important. So we need a piece of software where on the server side, there'll be something to respond to what browsers uh, are asking for. And uh, because initially it's just a, a, a way of, of describing where documents are. One group was internal to Microsoft, understanding that the web was the next big thing and they had to try to leverage their current monopoly over the desktop into the web. The other was a group of engineers who had originally worked on the academic version of uh, the server and now need to patch up a server. So they created a patchy server, which ended up being a patchy server. And then, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, 15 years worth of market adoption data. That is to say, who, how many servers on the net are using this piece of software? Now again, if in 1995 you asked a group of serious people, which of these two groups, a group of developers, who collaborated using a proprietary model that said no one gets to exclude anyone from the outputs of our common effort. Anyone can take it, copy it, distribute it, change it, distribute their changes, do whatever they want with it. And the other, Microsoft, leveraging its desktop monopoly as a core strategic move, it would have been laughable to suggest that after two booms and two busts, 15 years later, Apache would continue to occupy somewhere between 40 and 60% of the market. Microsoft would continue to, be, to, to play with it between 15 and 27% of the market, and everybody else would trade at the bottom. So when you're using Amazon, you're using free software. Um, mission critical software. Again, for those who believe in markets and market adoption as a measure of efficacy, it is impossible to ignore this bizarre phenomenon without at the same time undermining their own belief that if you have a system over this major period, irrespective of market crashes and, 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 and revivals, uh, being adopted in this form. So this is the fact that drives the necessity of accepting that we need an explanation. Uh, it's also a, a, a very rich set of actual practices to study. When I started looking at Wikipedia, in the summer of 2001, when it was about four or five months old for the first time, what attracted me about Wikipedia specifically was that it was the only uh, major uh, place where you saw hundreds of people at the time working without any technical constraints. They were, it was a purely norms-driven environment, whereas all of the other collaborative uh, uh, projects that I was able to see at the time, like Slashdot, uh, which was another uh, site I studied, had very discrete ways of building into the network assumptions about how people could uh, defect and constrain them, whereas Wikipedia was very much of a norms-based um, 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 system. And, and it's continued to be a norms-based system primarily with, with, of course, additional layers as it grew uh, in size. Another thing that happened with free software is that it stopped being something that was bizarre and got normalized into standard ways of talking about uh, efficiency and innovation and competition. 
around the time that Microsoft, the largest patent holder in the United States, shifted, these are patent revenues for, for IBM in green, and these are open source services related. So essentially, using Linux and Apache as part of the software package that they sell as a service, we'll come and send you, sell you a solution. Between 2000 and 2003, open source moves from being insignificant to being a larger source of revenue than uh, uh, patent royalties uh, for IBM, the largest patent holder uh, in the United States. Um, and now we basically have seen a point at which there's enough acceptance by a whole bunch of companies in IT that free software, free and open source software are essentially a space for pre-competitive uh, collaboration and innovation among the firms. So that about half of the developers today are paid by firms to participate in this commons production process. Half are not. To the point that now there are appropriate questions that I want to, I'm happy to put on the table later today. Mostly I think they'll be appropriate by the end of tomorrow's uh, lecture of the extent to which what we're seeing here is a real tension and instability with the market trying to capture the commons. But at the same time, all of these firms continue to actually uh, embrace licensing techniques that say, I've put my effort into this, and this is now available to anyone to use on a commons basis. And to the extent that we see actual organizational studies of what the relationship between the free software developers inside firms and their managers are, in order to be an effective employee of IBM or Google working on an open source project, the firm has to respect that the loyalty has to be divided. And that to the extent that somebody is developing something for the Linux kernel, it's got to be that it's got to be good for the kernel first and the boss second in order for it to go in even though it means that the employee can begin to work on this. So, so a real uh, potential point of tension there, but also a, a potential point of, of um, uh, integration between the two approaches. Essentially what we see is that for the first time in a long time, the most important inputs into the core economic activities of the most advanced economies are widely distributed in the population. Both material, in terms of computation and communications and storage resources, and, se uh, and sensing and capture, and human, that is to say creativity, intuition, experience, motivation, all of these are widely distributed in the population and not really capable of full transfer, as well as social capabilities to manage processes, um, uh, the internal organizational uh, uh, practices. What that has meant is that behaviors that were once on the periphery, social motivations, cooperation, friendship, decency, mobilization, as well as hatred and envy, move to the very core of economic life in the most technically and economically advanced societies in the most technically advanced sectors of those economies. Two things emerge from this. The first is commons-based production. Individual or collaborative, you also have individual work. Commercial or non-commercial, as we've seen already, there are both commercial forms of commons-based production and non-commercial. Um, what this does is, in is it increases the diversity of actors' motivations and transactional forms instead of optimizing for people looking for commercial as opposed to people for looking for non-commercial, you see essentially spaces of creation between different kinds of people and different kinds of communities and organizations. What's critical about the commons, that is to say the absence of exclusive proprietary claim to the inputs and outputs, is the decentralization of authority to act so that authority to act resides where technology has placed practical capacity to act at the edges of the network. Instead of an assembly line that required, that concentrated capacity to act where physical capital was, the decentralization of physical capital also decentralized the practical capacity to acquire, process, and store existing information and create new. What the commons does is locate practical authority to act where practical capacity to act resides, and that's why the commons is so important. In addition to being able to act, you also don't have to ask permission, and this was critical. Um, the second thing, a subset of commons-based production has been peer production, that is to say large-scale cooperation among human contributors that is organized neither by classic price signals in the classic market model, nor by managerial commands in the firm in the market uh, model. 
but rather on a variety of models of uh, uh, social relations, social signaling, uh, social norms, dis deciding who should act on what, how should things be done, how should things that one person has done be incorporated into a collective uh, model. Not through models of hierarchy, not through models of firms, but through uh, models of social collaboration. Now, in these models, as we see, as we know in many other uh, social settings, hierarchies do emerge. Relations of power do emerge. That's part of what I want to talk about tomorrow and part of what I think is important to talk about today. As we've matured in the last five to 10 years in these practices, we begin to see studies about how, what forms of power and control emerge within these systems. But at baseline, if, if we had in the past, uh, because of the high cost of capital, this dichotomy of either the market or the state, or rather either the firm in the market or the state with some level of control being uh, 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 hierarchical, what we see is a third social model interjecting um, 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 uh, as a possibility. Essentially, if we go along axes of decentralization and centralization and market-based and non-market-based, effective economic production, except for uh, uh, certain kinds of practices within families, among friends, and localized efforts, primarily op occupied the firms and government with some large star non-profits and the price system. And what we're seeing today in the networked environment is an increasing acceptance and push from sectors, if, if, if the 1990s Clinton-Blair uh, approximation of trying to make government better by mimicking markets, the axis was moving government systems to market-like mechanisms, what we're seeing today is an increasing move both of internal effectiveness, like Wikipedia, on decentralized uh, network social models, uh, but also efforts to leverage these models in small firms and in the market, in largely and relatively structured firms, as well as in government and newly effective nonprofits. So these are populated by a variety of players, various entrepreneurial firms, whether it's TripAdvisor to replace uh, Fodor, whether it's Yelp to replace um, uh, uh, the Michelin Guide, or YouTube, or Skype, obviously, whether, as we talked about already, IBM or, or Google's uh, uh, open source strategy, uh, whether it's the Sunlight Foundation that I'll describe in just a few minutes, whether it's the BBC News, I'll also mention in a few minutes, whether it's the efforts, for example, this is Boston's effort at what they're calling new urban mechanics of trying to actually use the net to get citizens uh, uh, as part of what feeds information into the government uh, uh, to make it more effective in terms of local government and, and more responsive. And obviously the various models of either free software or the various wiki-like universe Things like couch surfing with, with uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people sharing couches all over the world um, as they travel, or Ushahidi that I'll show you a, a little video uh, of what the concept is um, uh, in, a, in a second or two. The basic model of this as a solution space is to take an information production problem or a cultural production problem and structure it in a way that harnesses the efforts of people on the web working together neither through a price signal nor uh, through command. So this is a right-wing blog uh, that wanted to know who put a secret hole. This is already an old story, but this was the first one that I could find that used this particular technique. Um, uh, Porkbusters, uh, who put a secret hold on an, uh, on an Obama Coburn, on a then Senator Obama Coburn bill uh, uh, for transparency? Pick up the phone and call your senator and demand. Once you find out, let us know. And in fact, within about 24 hours, this was then copied on the left wing of the blogosphere. Both sides bring together. They found that it was then Senator Stevens, uh, and the hold was lifted. In what sense do I mean a solution space? Sunlight Foundation then becomes a foundation that starts to say, how do we build systems that, on one hand, take government data and make it more easily available? And on the other, harness these models of collaborative production to engage in watchdog function. So for example, one Friday afternoon, uh, they launched this project, uh, 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 this project of, of uh, family values, where essentially they created six different screens in which users were invited to say, find a member of Congress you care about, plug in their name in this database. 
Take the output from this database, plug it in this database. Take the output from this, plug it in this database. Each database was itself created by some other organization out there in the world. So that by the end of that weekend, they were able to identify every single member of Congress use of campaign funds to pay their spouse. That's what I mean by a solution space that makes a nonprofit foundation more effective, but at the same time uses the relatively structured model of the nonprofit organization to concentrate effort on a particular uh, model uh, by building uh, this platform. More recently, we have Ushahidi, and as you, as you look at this 22-minute video, think with me or try to keep in your mind the iterative use of collaborative production to produce what is essentially a Kenyan platform developed during the, the, the riots in Kenya for people around a particular area to identify events, to identify, identify potential, potential solutions, to communicate about them, to match them up in a usable uh, framework that allows them to then coordinate action, and then to deploy their action. This system um, 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 most recently was used, for example, in Russia uh, to coordinate responses um, uh, to the wildfires um, in uh, when the state was not responding. So essentially where they are and who needs help and where it can go. Imagine a way for people all over the world to tell the story of what was happening to them or around them during a disaster or emergency situation. It would need to be easy to use something that almost anybody can do, and it would need to be deployable worldwide. And that's why we've created Ushahidi. Ushahidi is the Swahili word meaning testimony or witness. Born from the post-election violence in Kenya in 2008, Ushahidi kept Kenyans current on vital information and provided invaluable assistance to those providing relief. It was deployed in the Democratic Republic of Congo to monitor unrest, Al Jazeera used it to track violence in Gaza. It was used to help monitor the 2009 Indian elections and to help gather reports globally about the recent swine flu outbreak. Anybody can contribute information, whether it's a simple text message from an SMS capable phone, a photo or video from a smartphone, or a report submitted online. Ushahidi can gather information from any device with a digital data connection. After a report is submitted, it's posted in near real time to an interactive map that can be viewed on a computer or smartphone. But the most powerful feature Ushahidi offers is the ability to take the core application and deploy it yourself to suit your community's needs. Since Ushahidi is open source, anyone can improve the service in any way they see fit. Our growing community of developers are constantly at work improving Ushahidi to bring it to as many people as possible, including... So again, my point here, several layers of, of the point. The first point is you take an approach to a solution. How do you find out what's going on where under chaotic conditions? You create it for a domain specifically that is about violence in a context of a state that is not functioning well to support it. Then you transfer it you use from open source software a development approach that allows you to develop, to, to harness the contributed developments of, of developers from around the world to improve the system under a licensing system. So now we're talking about an institutional system that allows anyone who then needs it to take and tweak it to their purposes. And the purposes can then be not only about reporting, but also about organizing action. So as I said again, in the context of the Russian uh, fires, what happened was that uh, this was also then organized to say, we need somebody here with these kinds of materials that are lost. So it was also about organizing responses in a context where uh, essentially failed state or, or partially failed state solution uh, uh, in that context. Um, so it becomes a solution space and the iterated practice of cooperative production creates both platforms and practices, and because the institution itself is open, it allows its, its reapplication to different uh, uh, contexts. We see it integrated into other models. The BBC found this out when the only photos from the London Underground bombing were from people's mobile phones. 
Uh, then they integrated as a standard feature, and now we see CNN using it, uh, uh, New York Times using it, etc. The thing that's happening here is the fact that presence, experience, is humanly unique and distributed, and, um, 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 uh, and the devices are everywhere. The sensors are everywhere, and so you can harness sensors from everywhere. This was the beginning, the place at which, if I'd say, the equivalent of the first Gulf War that was the coming out of the, um, um, of the 24 hour news channel, was the Iranian reform movement that was the coming out of the uh, video on the mobile phone and YouTube. That was the moment at which, if you saw the news from Iran, on the BBC, on CNN, wherever you saw it, the video source was always people on the street because none of the other models actually had access to the materials. As I said, we see it in various uh, startups. Uh, we also begin to see it integrated into business models that begin to shade into questions of exploitation. So threadless, the consumers design the t-shirt, they vote on the t-shirt they want, the company then uh, um, uh, gives prizes to, uh, 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 to the designers and, and prints those, the system, those uh, designs that the users uh, uh, um, um, uh, vote. They create a celebrity system, so you wear their designs, now read their thoughts. There's a celebrity system of celebrity designers, there's a small prize, and suddenly you're beginning to mix motivations of both prize money and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, celebrity uh, integrated into the system, and ultimately, Five years ago, I'd say this was all considered part of the same phenomenon. So Amazon Mechanical Turk, for a matter of pennies, uh, you harness thousands of people to do various uh, problems that are hard for computers to do, like tag images. Uh, and this is where you begin. So again, at one level, this is harnessing decentralized production. At another, it's a highly structured, one-dimensional system where the employers see the employees, the employees don't see the employers where you've got um, about 20 or 30 percent of the population of workers from India, where the wages are relatively low, but the efficacy is relatively high. How do we interpret this? Given when the little bit of experiments that we've done, there's a lot of usage during office hours in the US. So is this subversion with workers making more money on their boss's time? Or is this exploitation? It starts being harder. Uh, 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 to map, and this is something again that I want to come back to um, um, in the second half of tomorrow's uh, um, talk. Uh, but this is the again, as we talked about with open source, the beginning of the question of is this the decentralized model shoving the market aside in certain ways, or is it the market incorporating and co-opting? Uh, both of those are, are are potential interpretations of what we're seeing. So now let me spend the the, the next. 20 minutes or so I think I have um, um, uh, before I should stop and we should open to talk, extend. And the basic question I want to ask is can it be online, only online, and the answer of course is not. Uh, but how do we push back on the dominance of the rational actor model in a targeted, design-focused, outcomes-driven way? Uh, how do we harness the same set of, or a similar set of, um, uh, conceptual, argumentative, evidence-based move that take from the effectiveness of online collaboration to make the point about institutional design and system design aimed toward increasing cooperation as opposed to aimed toward uh, um, 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 responding to the classical rational actor model in the context of, of, of uh, the environment, the, 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 the real world. Um, and my answer, as you'll see, will be to anchor in large part, to identify this as a design approach, to anchor it in what I see as an interesting move of the last 15 years in some of the core disciplines that have been the strongest source of support for the standard rational actor model, shifting actually towards more cooperative model, towards new work in experimentalism, uh, that would support um, uh, increased uh, um, 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 acceptance of the diversity of human motivations, the importance of, of sociality, and the importance and the feasibility of cooperation through respect for certain core norms of, of sociality. Um, and finally, integrating these back with observational work 
from uh, organizational sociology and management science, from, from, from um, um, social software design, to put together a design approach more generally aimed towards seeing people as more diversely motivated and primarily as, as much more cooperative than the dominant rational actor model would accept, and how that can be translated into actual system design. So that's the effort. I won't go through all of this in 20 minutes. I'll try to give you a sense of each piece of the argument, and then we can dig into any given one of them uh, later on in response to questions. Um, so we start out with what are their systems. So if we look at one domain in which classic rational actor theory uh, played a role, you've got Gary Becker, 68, uh, uh, interpreting crime as uh, a sheer rational trade-off between cost and benefit, penalty times the probability of detection equals deterrence, and that's obviously a strong argument in favor of things like three strikes and you're out, uh, uh, increased pr police protection, um, increasing either one or the other. Of course, what we also saw since the 1980s is the rise of community policing. I know you had a, uh, one of the real utopia uh, uh, projects was, was on, uh, around Archon Fung's work, which was partly on this. What we see in the move to community uh, policing is each of these systems being switched. So on the technical level, walk, not car, because the human interaction uh, is different. On the organizational level, taking people off 911 to become uh, in, uh, so that they are not constantly responding just to criminals or victims, uh, but to people uh, 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 in the community, monthly community meetings, agenda setting, institutional, providing more room for uh, discretion, and as a consequence, social humanization, changing us then boundaries, um, uh, norms and trust, and efforts to build norms and trust. Now, unfortunately, um, I don't know, and I'd be curious to hear if anyone here does, of good um, uh, effectiveness studies of community policing, particularly distinguishing it from CompStat, which is the information-rich hierarchical model of, of police reform. So we had these two police reform movements in the 80s uh, in response to uh, uh, concern with, with, with crime. We've seen massive decline in crime, which uh, to some extent may or may not be affected by policing uh, differences. We see community policing as enormously um, 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 popular large numbers of communities joining, large numbers of police officers on community policing. We see crime decline in both kinds of, of reforms. Um, uh, so it's certainly popular and populations are happy with it, whether it's more effective than a better run hierarchical information rich system like Comstock, or equally uh, uh, as I don't know of the data that compares it. But my point here is the uh, is clearly building a system that's built on very different motivational assumptions uh, than this system, and at least having it be both effective and, and <coughs> expanding as an institution that's ca captured. The major place, of course, um, uh, to look is is the is the workplace. So the classic uh, uh, standard rational actor model uh, that looks at getting people to work requires incentives and monitoring that employees will shirk if given the opportunity. And so you basically need a system of rewards, punishment, and monitoring as the standard model. And we see it operating at all levels of uh, uh, the corporation, from shop floor relations to <coughs> supplier relations and competitive bidding, and all the way to executive compensation. So um, um, uh, I suspect I don't need to describe here. Uh, again, though, what I want to talk about is the combination of different systems. You've got an organizational system with, with Taylorism, describing the idea of motion studies and uh, uh, describing very discreetly what each motion of each uh, worker needs to be. You've got it embedded in the Fordist assembly line in a technical system that regiments and regulates technically the same principle. Um, and you've got monitoring uh, within this system uh, to assure compliance. Uh, you even get the development of a theory of the firm uh, 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 by Oliver Williamson, who sees it, the firm's particular distinction and boundaries in its comparative efficiency at controlling opportunity. So the raison d'etre of the firm is, is controlling opportunism and the idea of, 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 of uh, uh, employees uh, essentially trying to uh, shirk and other players trying to shirk. Of course, that leaves the question of uh, the, uh, 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 the CEO and who monitors the CEO. 
And that's where you get over the 80s, ultimately with 1990 with the Jensen and Murphy uh, um, um, uh, piece of agency theory, um, uh, the model that the CEO also needs to be aligned in incentives because the CEO is also going to be the one who's going to go out, uh, look out for themselves. So they need to be compensated in stock so that they look out for the stockholders. So now you've got a theory that doesn't differentiate between, a, a, between people. Everybody is just out for their own um, uh, good. And you've got, and you try to build the incentives in these systems to align them all in the same direction. Then, of course, we have this uh, about the 40 years of assumption of selfishness, which is too delicious not to listen to. Well, where do you think you made a mistake? I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, was such is that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders. So this was, this was to me, one of these great moments where you have, um, uh, for 40 years I believed in a certain <coughs> ideology, and it turned out not to be true. Um, I would have thought that that lesson would last for longer, but apparently it doesn't seem to have. But anyway, uh, back to our stories. So in the last year and a half, it's a little awkward to talk about Toyota as a good model. But nonetheless, um, uh, let me tell you a very specific uh, uh, story that I think is very, very important in explaining uh, the difference. So this is an old story now. It's a 30-year-old story. The GM Fremont plant um, uh, uh, was one of the worst performing uh, in that system with something like 20% absenteeism at the time, relatively high fail rates. Um, it was shut down and after three years opened as a collaborative effort between Toyota and GM under Toyota production. Um, uh, almost the entire uh, same workforce uh, uh, unionized, uh, reorganized so that the shift from Taylorism to Toyota production system, for example, instead of 70 process engineers on the shop floor with time management studies in the old GM Fremont plant, zero process engineers on the floor. Instead of a single employee working at a particular designated spot, uh, four to five, teams of four to five with an explicit uh, 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 goal of continuous uh, improvement and experimentation and change with one person always on the side looking at the others. Eventually, after a couple of years with quality uh, circles and meetings uh, for discussing how to change the production process, um, within two years, the plant became the best uh, performing in the US, again, with the same employees. Um, remained one of the three most productive plants uh, for the uh, many years. Uh, closed last year and is reopening as a, as a joint uh, uh, project between Toyota and Tesla uh, for electric cars, so we'll see where it goes. The critical thing that, did, that this did, for example, in, in some circles in management science was whatever stories you used to be able to tell about there's something special about Japanese culture and that's why they do it differently but it wouldn't work in the US couldn't work when you took the same plant with the same workers, still unionized with the same unions, where all of the team leaders are themselves uh, union members and got the results that were so much better. You had to explain something about a, much le uh, about a different model of organization. The interesting story here is that the same thing then repeated itself with supplier relations. Um, essentially, one of, the story, one of the things that happened is that uh, competition drove the Japanese firm away from the Kiretsu model towards something that was slightly more flexible but still depended on relatively long-term relations. And it drove, at least formally, over the course of the 90s in particular, uh, the US firms from pure reliance on competitive bidding to something that was more of a trust-based system. So essentially you got both of the systems moving towards something that was more of an overlap in the relations. But habits die hard, and so essentially the continuous complaints in the late 90s, early 2000s from the suppliers, again, these are US suppliers of the US plants of uh, the Japanese manufacturers, um, was that they would disclose, for example, a new innovation. And then they would find the, the one of the big three turning around and disclosing it to its competitors and putting it in a competitive bidding situation after all. Or demanding that the cost reductions, or demanding cost reductions in the last minute. So you've got this, this classic uh, uh, quote from, from one study 
about one of the suppliers saying, why are you doing this? We're giving better products to the same exact competitors over there in different plants from the same exact suppliers in the US. Why are you doing this? And Rick Wagner's reply was, uh, stop whining. Um, finally, in the same approach, uh, if you look at executive compensation, these two uh, photos are essentially scaled to compensation. Uh, between the CEO of Toyota in 2006 and the CEO of GM in 2006. Um, uh, clearly, uh, this was not uh, performance-based. Um, but rather, what you get is more research that essentially, once you actually push the compensation towards executive uh, stock, you see lower term, uh, 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 shorter term returns at the expense of longer term uh, returns. You see essentially the effort to subvert in order to increase, the IRS comes out and sees the higher probability of being described as a tax fraud uh, 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 company. Uh, the more you have uh, uh, executive compensation in stock. Um, and essentially, the thing that I want to talk about with both of these systems is that when you looked at the GM system at the time, it was coherent and sensible. If you had the model that all people were self-interested rationally trying to maximize their material rewards and nothing else. It was true for the shop floor, it was true for the supplier relationship, and it was true for executive pay. And you saw the alternative. And in particular with the Fremont plant and the Louis plant itself, what you saw was that the same people structured in a more collaborative form would produce uh, more effectively and would be happier. So essentially, surveys of employee satisfaction, when I say would be happier, is what I'm, is what I'm referring to. Um, so essentially what we see in classic areas of firm organization, in classic areas of government function, as well as online, we see these systems that are built more on a model of rational self-interest integrated into a system that's intended to incentivize, monitor, reward, and punish, so that all of these assumed to be self-interested rational actors would align with the goals of whatever the collective ex enterprise is. Shifting towards systems that depend on more diverse motivations, that engage people differently, and build technical, institutional, organizational, and social cultural uh, components that elicit intrinsic motivation to collaborate and be more creative and aim toward um, 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 pursuing the common goal. So the question then becomes how we develop a system of cooperative human systems uh, uh, as an integrated approach, technical, organizational, institutional, and social, with mutually reinforcing design characteristics so as not to make them inconsistent based on the best evidence that we have. Now we have a decision to make. I could spend three or four minutes outlining, or no, I could spend, let's say, six or seven minutes outlining what these are and giving one or at most two examples of how to play it out and then open it for half an hour. I could spend 15 minutes giving a little bit more of that. What would you prefer? Well, Why don't I start with six or seven and then we'll see how Yeah, and also since we have um, the open forum discussion on Friday and the discussion tomorrow, I think you can play okay. it by ear yourself a little to see how much you want to front load the ideas versus... Okay. So we'll play along. Um, one of the interesting things that's supporting this effort is that some of the core uh, um, uh, disciplines that uh, uh, for 40 or more years have been pushing in the direction of uh, self-interest have gone over the last 10, 15 years toward more openness to um, 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 cooperation. Whether it's evolutionary biology that in the early 60s abandons most forms of cooperation focus pure, focuses purely at most on kin altruism, uh, which is essentially a self-interested, uh, uh, genetically self-interested uh, behavior as the only explanation of cooperation toward ever increasing and fuzzier uh, models that accept cooperation as sustainable, whether it's economics that increasingly through experimental economics is challenging internally to the discipline. Uh, the assumptions of self-interest, whether it's political si uh, political uh, science going from Downs and also in the late 50s, uh, mid 60s about rational self-interest and uh, positive political theory, rational actor, rational choice as the dominant model 
in many political science departments, uh, uh, to Eleanor Rostrom and governing the commons, and uh, within political theory, moving towards more openness. And as I said, again, since the auto production system, both in management science, uh, and less surprisingly, of course, in, in organizational sociology, uh, uh, work um, 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 on, on more collaborative models uh, uh, of production. Um, so let me give you an example of how this looks in one discipline, and then let me run forward, and then let me stop. So 1976, Richard Dawkins, in a, in a popularization of what was at the time certainly the consensus, makes the following statement. Be warned that it, consensus, I'd say, among people doing evolutionary biology, mathematical, particular mathematical evolutionary biology. Be warned that if you wish, as I do, to build a society in which individuals cooperate generously and unselfishly towards a common good, you can expect little help from biological nature. Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. Let us understand what our own selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their designs, something which no other species ever aspired to do. 30 years later in science, Martin Novak writes, perhaps the most remarkable aspect of evolution is its ability to generate cooperation in a competitive world. Thus we might add natural cooperation as a third fundamental principle of evolution beside mutation and natural selection. So this is in science. Uh, so, so the discipline has gone a large uh, uh, distance in 30 years. Um, and I won't go into the details of, uh, at this point, but the point is you see similar things. Uh, so in, in, uh, uh, when, when you begin to read in the American Economic Review in 2006 something from two completely mainstream mathematical modelers uh, uh, like Jean Tirol uh, and Roland Benabou um, about um, uh, using signaling theory to explain why people would care about uh, behaving in ways that are moral or social, you begin to see even that discipline beginning to move, though much more slowly, uh, uh, in this direction. So I won't go into uh, a lot of stuff that I would want to go into. Uh, um, but we can always talk about it later. Um, what we're looking at is, so, so what I want to talk about with regard to cooperative human systems design is to think about what the building blocks that would essentially play an abstraction layer. There's a lot of work in evolutionary biology, in neuroscience, in economics, in political science, and obviously in sociology, in psychology, in anthropology, that, that has a basic science uh, style to it in terms of identifying what discrete components will increase or decrease the probability that a population of people who have the kinds of diverse motivations that we do will increase or decrease the levels of cooperation. And we have various observational studies, like for example the case study of the Nui plan or, or a case study of Wikipedia or, or whatever, that we can try to generalize from. And the question is, what's a, a set of mid-level abstractions that allow you to say, here's a whole set of things here in the basic science that say this is important. And here's a whole bunch of ways in which you can say, if you look at these, these are applications of this design lever, this design component, this sociality enabling system element. And now let's identify a set of these so that we can begin to develop a, develop a discipline of cooperative human system design that is based on evidence capable of application and is treated as simply a design, uh, 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 organizational, institutional, technical, legal design discipline. And obviously communication and framing are absolutely central. Um, um, ways in which we expand the utility curve of the actors essentially, the I, the thou, the we, and the them. Uh, uh, the centrality of what's right, what's fair, and what's normal, and defining these. Uh, the way in which we deal with calculation, both material and social uh, relational, and how when we do have rewards, we avoid some of the negative consequences when sometimes when you make something, uh, you go to dinner and you bring a bottle of wine and you go to a social dinner, that's great. If you go to dinner and you leave a $50 check at the end, uh, that's not great. Money doesn't always add to an activity. Punishment doesn't always cause, uh, uh, and threats don't always cause, Parent says to teenager, don't you dare spin those wheels. Yeah. Okay? We know this. The question is how we incorporate it. 
as well as various other forms of, of, of social dynamics, um, um, uh, trust, transparency, reputation, what their relationship is um, um, that need to go into this. So the basic practice uh, uh, is something along the lines of finding a set, this is particularly, for example, a meta-analysis of a lot of uh, experimental prisoners' dilemma game, showing that once you add communication without changing payoffs at all, um, uh, uh, you can um, uh, improve communication. A whole set of studies that show that when the communication is face-to-face, -face, you get higher levels of cooperation uh, than otherwise. And of course, communication is absolutely central to practices of team production, of cooperative management. So for example, what does it mean? Do you or don't you have a discussion page on Wikipedia? Of course you do. What do people do with it? What is it when someone writes te in text, hmm? <laughs> what are they doing when they're saying, hmm? They're humanizing, right? So you start with a relatively aggressive, this is so bad, anyway, and then somebody else says, hmm. And suddenly it becomes a collaborative uh, practice because communication is suddenly something that, that pulls people uh, in uh, together. Yahoo Developer Networks actually has a fascinating set of nodes, nodes that begins to work to, uh, uh, in, in the direction that I'm talking about with regard to cooperative human systems design in the sense that they're talking about the design of social aspects of a social network or social system to a developer, to somebody who's just building the technical system. So one of the things, the core principle, the first core principle, talk like a person. Talk like a person as a design characteristic for software developers writing uh, these systems. Uh, your versus my, the I versus the, the, the thou. It's not, uh, it's another human being. Um, Framing, frame analysis, framing the situation. So again, if you look, for example, this is my point about it not being just about technical systems. If you look at litigation at an institutional system, it has certain rituals that are intended to evoke legitimacy through role-based process. Counsel, your honor, a very hierarch a public performance of the hierarchical relationship uh, a robe-based performance of impartiality intended to uh, plug into our respect for processes, but in that design, crowding out the possibility for a cooperative outcome, accepting its impossibility, and making a claim. When you look at the more recent move towards mediation, as you read the handbooks of, of, the, the, of, the, of the most uh, uh, widely used handbooks, the very first system, the very first set of, of components that you read is talk. Sit down, two mediators, and let people talk. So again, you're building a particular design component into the actual systems um, as they are. Um, lots of good stories. Empathy turns out to be a, a, a really important and valuable thing. So, so again, how does this work? This is another classic study by, by Iris Bonnet and Bruno Frey. Um, they ran a dictator game. A dictator game is a, 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 is a game in which experimenter gives subject A, let's say $10, subject A that can then give to subject B anywhere from zero to $10. Subject B goes home with whatever subject A gave. Subject A goes home with whatever's left over from what the uh, experimenter gave. So it's a, there's no strategic interaction. This is pure altruism measure. So what did they do? They put them in the room. When, they, when the recipients were anonymous, the average donation was 26, and 28% of all the participants gave nothing. When all they did was they had the B recipients just stand up as a group so that there was actually a face attached to who the recipient was, even though still no one knew who was giving what and who was getting what. The average donation went up to 35% of the endowment and 11% gave zero. When the recipients sent in an anonymous note that said, here's my major, here's my hobby, here's my something, the donations went up to 50% of the endowment on average and zero uh, gave zero. Just that, no communication. That's, and again, when I'm talking about system elements, why is empathy in some sense different from communication? Because this is an effect that occurs without a single word passing. No coordination, no communication, nothing. Just the humanization of the other side. So how do you build that um, uh, into systems? Well, uh, eating together. 
um, building uh, uh, platform components. So um, solidarity and group identity obviously play a role. So here's a situation where a system like SETI at Home creates the possibility for people to come together. So some of it is ready-made uh, 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 identities like SETI USA, SETI Germany, etc. But some of it is allowing people to create their own playful identities like this, the fourth most uh, largest contributing uh, group at the time uh, to SETI at Home, uh, the Knights who say me. Um, <laughs> who build their own platform then, which interestingly then integrates a variety of things like, for example, uh, this is KWSN is nice to say me. Um, the KWSN round table, friendly place to chat for all members of KWSN. So again, communication is built in, but also identity. But obviously we know that identity is uh, also dangerous. There's as much in-group as out-group. So one of the things we need, and this is a very volatile material, one of the things we need are, are various um, um, positive outputs or positive outlets uh, for this model. So I won't go into more. I want to open it up for conversation. Um, critical things that we get, again, in the similar, so all I want to say about these things is this. For each of these categories, morality, mo moral claims of what's right, um, what's fair, what's normal, um, all of these have similar bases in these kinds of studies, either in evolutionary biology or in economics or in experimental psychology. Um, um, also have characteristics within, observa uh, 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 within observation studies of various practices and can then be implemented in platforms, in, 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 in platform designs, whether it's codes of honor, whether it's uh, the use of norms on Wikipedia, um, maybe I'll just focus on this for a moment. So this is not in a place where people have a lot of agreement. This is on the talk page about a particular, uh, uh, about a page on creationism. This is an argument between people who disagree about whether it's a two-sided debate, creationists and people who believe in uh, 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 and, and evolutionary science, or whether there's this third way of people who are believers who also believe in, in evolution, whether that's a third way or not. So it starts out with a lot of anger. But one of the things you begin to see is that very quickly they begin to throw at each other norms, specific norms. No original research. No, you can't, it's not a place for you to use your opinions. It's not a soapbox. Hey, don't assume good against good that I that I don't have good faith. And what they're doing in this in this process, as you go through several pages of the argument between these two, is they're continuously using the norms to create a shared space of what we're still in this common enterprise together. Then someone else shows up, calms the spirits down, and they're able to, to, to come up with a resolution. But the norms here play a very important uh, role in actually structuring the relationship. The solution is not a hierarchical one. The solution is a negotiated one through an anchoring that's very powerful in norms. Um, Fairness turns out to matter a great deal. Um, this I'll talk about tomorrow. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, 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 ways in which error can be introduced. Um, so this is the world intellectual property has a program of intellectual property for small and medium, uh, and medium enterprises. And their answer is for these enterprises that are about innovation and, and, and harnessing creative effort from employees are, Employees are the biggest threat. An employer owes, uh, automatically owes confidentiality to the employer. However, in an environment where employee mobility is high, psychological contracts are no longer reliable. It implies that giving formal legal contracts of greater importance becomes more important. So this is the most, this is supposedly the best advice that the people doing IP can give to small businesses about how to, uh, 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 this is a classic system element where you say, don't use intrinsic motivation, trust, and reciprocity. Rely on a system that is reliable as against selfish employees, because employees are the largest threat. Now, as a matter of evidence, we have this beautiful set of studies originally done by Annalise Saxanian um, uh, in Silicon Valley, later on by, by Alan Hyde, by Ron Gilson, that looks at Route 128 and Silicon Valley and actually shows how Silicon Valley, a central part of Silicon Valley's um, uh, success was the high mobility because knowledge was so tacit, the high intrafirm mobility. What Ron Gilson was, uh, was able to identify 
was the fact that a precondition to that was the fact that in California, non-compete agreements against employees were not enforceable, and in Massachusetts they were. So in Massachusetts, firms had the choice to go this way and did, and in California they didn't. And lo and behold, since they didn't have the option, they suddenly made it a big deal to foster these new innovative firms and create real entrepreneurial relationships and build a whole innovation system on one in which it's fine for employees to go. We're proud, we recruit people by saying some of our best workers have gone and created their own firms. So this is clearly a system design error, not based on evidence, but on a theory of belief that's mistakenly believed. So these are also kinds of, um, uh, this is more of, of Yahoo's, uh, uh, in this case, reputation. Uh, the basic point I want to make is that scientific policy making for a long time has pushed back on widespread cultural norms of sharing, uh, but the actual practices in network environment increasingly in businesses revive sharing nicely the broad pro-social educational bent within which we infuse our educational system and family education. Diverse business and social production models begin to challenge efficiency, efficacy, and growth-oriented effects of scientific selfishness. Science begins to push back with theoretical, experimental, and observational work. And what we basically need now is an, a, a translational science of cooperative human systems design. Understanding technical, institutional, organizational, and social systems as integrated systems, um, um, understanding people as having diverse motivations, possibly diverse types or just diverse probabilities of behavior for any one of us in different contexts. Several disciplines and sources to formulate working hypotheses about intervention points or sociality enabling system elements. We need a lot of experimental experimentation and testing because we've had 40 years of refining exquisitely a mistaken, uh, uh, the, uh, the implications of a mistaken view of human nature uh, uh, and we need to uh, recover from that. So, questions, thoughts? I'm curious as to how you view uh, how the comments of collaborative and cooperative human systems design uh, dovetails or clashes with um, intellectual property rights, patents, and, and you made the, the WIPO example earlier. Um, so, uh, I've been uh, criticizing both the state and direction of intellectual property rights for the last, I don't know, 15, 17 uh, years. Uh, the short answer is that it is possible that there might be some level of intellectual property pr uh, protection that is effective and productive for some sectors somewhere here. Our current law is somewhere over here and applied to all sectors um, uh, in extreme ways uh, that don't make sense for some of these sectors. One of the way, so one of the things that I'll do tomorrow is I'll talk about a new study I did on the, on the music industry and looking at how the music industry's model has, has been very uh, um, uh, unsuccessful and what some alternative models are. Um, the case is most extreme with patents. Uh, um, in other words, um, I'd say that the consensus give or take, among economists um, who've looked uh, empirically at the effects of patents uh, is that we don't have evidence that patents actually increase innovation. Um, we have theories. Uh, we have stories. We don't have quantitative evidence. Um, classic study of this, for example, Josh Lerner looked 150 years, 66 countries, um, uh, studying um, uh, changes in patent law and um, uh, a decent measure of levels of innovation finding basically no effect. Uh, the only effect was that patents by firms from richer countries or patent rich countries were increased in countries that introduced patents uh, later on, but only very, very slightly. So essentially what you got was Innovations that already occurred in one place being patented in another was the primary effect. A very small negative effect otherwise in countries that are developing countries. Uh, but either a small negative or no effect. And, and this is not unique. So there, in the last decade, there have been several, uh, uh, there's the Lerner and Jaffe book, there have been several books and studies um, um, that have looked at this. So patents are the worst offenders. Um, I think the strongest uh, claim is that in small molecule pharmaceuticals, they do play a productive role. 
The only thing I would say about small molecule pharmaceuticals is that for all practical purposes, you could solve that through the, um, um, through the health regulation system. You don't actually need a patent system to solve that. You can give exclusivity of distribution, uh, which is what, to, so today the way that it works in terms of the actual battle on the ground is that you've got a 20 year patent and then the pharmaceuticals are also adding data exclusivity through the regulatory system. In other words, you can't distribute an off-patent drug as a generic unless you have clinical data that supports that it's safe and effective as much as the old one. So part of what's happening now with data exclusivity is that the originator firms are requiring, are getting states to require that generic, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the generic providers not rely on the originator's original uh, clinical data to distribute their materials. Given that the clinical data, uh, uh, basically the, the uh, 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 phase one, two, and three trials, uh, are by far a larger expense than the actual original development, that effectively is like an extension of the patent. So given that that's an extension of the patent, you could use it for the whole system and just get rid of the patents altogether. So patents is actually one place where to the best of evidence that we have, we could just get rid of it. Copyright is more complicated, and it also changes from sector to sector. I think copyright, for example, in academic uh, books is probably unnecessary. Um, copyright in books that are trade and fiction books probably is necessary. We don't have obvious, uh, um, um, we don't have obvious uh, 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 alternatives for non-academic authors. Music is very different. Unclear that copyright is necessary at all, and in fact, we have things, or I'll take that back. Copyright as against ultimate fans, not. But there's no particular reason not to have copyright as between artists and people who produce advertisements or something like that. So you could, you, 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 as I said, there are interesting ways in which you could tweak these systems to make them function well if you ignore the political dynamic, which is ever expansion. Sorry, that was probably more than one thing. Uh, that's good. Thank you. Hey, um, I wanted to ask about uh, sort of the question of like heterogeneity within these modes of social production and um, ways that heterogeneity is overcome. Uh, so in a lot of this literature on you know, social economy organizations, their sort of homogeneity helps to overcome these coordination cooperation problems. And you talked about identity, I ideology, the way that those tools are used. Um, have you seen in, in your research examples of cases in which within these experiments you do have significantly diverse interests? And I'm just wondering about how, how that process is overcome, or do these groups tend to promote similar thinking people coming together to solve problems which are relevant to their particular interests? So this is, a, this is a really fabulous set of questions. Uh, um, let me just make sure that I'm not answering the wrong question, or that I'm not. Um, so uh, what you're saying is, to what extent does the cultural or other dimension heterogeneity of potential participants in a given project undermine its effectiveness as a cooperative project as opposed to supports it or doesn't? Is that fair or? I'm almost like starting from the assumption that it does, and maybe that's a, a, a false. Assumption. Well, uh, so so it's an interesting it's an interesting question. So one of the things actually that um, that uh, um, is enormously beneficial about uh, about some of these cooperative systems is that they actually can allow for people with with, with heterogeneous experience and insight to collaborate in ways that might be very difficult otherwise. So if you imagine people within the same firm as homogeneous with regard to their approach to how to solve a given problem, and you're trying to find someone else's view of what counts as an acceptable solution, it's actually one of the ca core characteristics of open source software is that actually that some other person can come and work on. So in that regard, homogeneity is, is actually um, 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 uh, critical. The other thing that you're seeing in some of these projects, so this is what Ethan Zuckerman is now um, 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 a colleague of mine at the Berkman Center, 
is now working on, who's also one of the founders of Global Voices and one of the people sort of backing Mushahidi uh, uh, intellectually and, 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 and practically in the, in the, in, in, in the development uh, community. Um, he talks about xenophiles, about, about the possibility of people who are actually affirmatively seeking other people. So couch surfing is an excellent example of this. Couch surfing, about a million users, um, doing something that in principle you would imagine some people might be uncomfortable with, which is arranging to be able to knock on someone's door in a foreign city and crash on their couch and spend two or three days uh, in a system that explicitly prohibits payment. Right? The one thing you can't do with a couch, the one thing you can't use couch surfing for without breaking the rules of the system is as a P2P um, um, uh, room rental uh, uh, system. Um, so there, again, it, at, at what level are you defining homogeneity? Is, is the homogeneity being somebody who seeks others? People who are very different? Yeah, but then it's not clear what work it's doing. Um, that's it. Um, shared assumptions matter a great deal about what counts as appropriate, what counts as not appropriate. I have one I have one student now who but it's too soon to tell. I, I, I mean um, um, actually I have another couple who are also working on something else. Trying to look at um, um, uh, the different language Wikipedias to look at to what extent it's possible to correlate governance and practice within these linguistic different language Wikipedias correlating to uh, national uh, uh, characteristics of, of institutions. In particular, one of them is looking at legal, essentially at the extent to which legal culture in the country gets replicated in the, in the Wikipedia of that language. Harder to do with English because you've already got so much diversity um, uh, in terms of who contributes, both English speakers and non-English speakers. Somewhat easier to do with other languages. So we'll see. I don't know. I think it's an interesting question. We clearly see tremendous uh, variation between countries. So there's one very interesting um, study that, that, that is really pertinent to this question. Uh, uh, so this study um, basically ran public goods games under an experimental setting with a punishment option. Um, and, and the background to this is that public goods games uh, without punishment, I'd say they're, they're multiplayer uh, prisoner's dilemmas in an experimental setting. Usually start with half the people cooperating and half defecting, and then over 10 rounds, cooperation declines because people realize they're being taken for a ride. If you add, co if you add punishment, people then start cooperating again. It's still a form of cooperation because punishment is itself a public goods problem. So one of the things that's interesting is that when you actually go and do it in different countries, it turns out there's enormous variation in how much antisocial uh, retribution there is. Whether people who get punished then punish back, even though they were bad and the other guy wasn't. So it turns out to be enormous. So then, whether or not you introduce something like the possibility to punish depends enormously on your background assumptions of how people will respond. Yeah. Right, you I want to get back to the question of power. I mean, this is all really interesting. And you've got these potentials that are there. But to release them, you've got to roll back the patents and that model that is a very powerful system, is being perpetuated, and is tough to roll back. And even in the, in the you know, it's one thing if you can get a bunch of people together to uh, tell the Russians where to send their stuff with a common social end to get rid of the fires. It's another thing when you've got a commodity and a saleable product out there. And the whole software system is actually built on the general public license or iterations thereof. They create a protected space in which it's not possible for Microsoft or Apple to appropriate the product of, of social production. So this is all really cool, but you, you come up against that problem of power. And what do you do about that? And I'm interested in the ways in which existing, they found with a general public license, that you've got to create the protected space and using existing contract and property rights law 
to enhance and expand that space. And you know, I don't mean you get that to the so tomorrow, I think, but I think this is all an that lays on this, doesn't I it? I think this is an enormously valuable uh, question. Um, I'd say that, um, as I put it at the end of, 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 of uh, the book, um, none of this is determined. Right? <coughs> this is all contested, highly contested. Uh, in um, uh, major, in, 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 in battles between uh, groups with very powerfully conflicting uh, uh, interests. Um, uh, one of the students who wrote comments on the book um, uh, as part of, 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 of Eric's seminar um, raised the question of um, uh, why am I so down on the state? So why are all my solutions very much about essentially a, a, a form of mutual aid that is non-state? And the answer is that in these areas, um, the state has largely played a destructive role in ratcheting up institutional constraints on individual freedom and the ability of communities to roll their own. Um, at the behest of 20th century's incumbents trying to control these systems. I'll give you what is perhaps the most troubling example. President Obama came on and talked about um, uh, open government, talked about open government transparency and open data, and began to institute as one of his first directives, it's not his first directive, the open government initiative of putting government data out. Two weeks ago, we get the formal release of the supposedly final non-negotiable draft of ACTA, the anti-counterfeiting uh, 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 trade agreement, that for all practical purposes tries to expand the most radical and expansive forms of intellectual property, um, not only in the US and lengthen it beyond the US, but in other countries as well, embedded through the trade system. This was a secret process. No one had access to the materials. Occasionally there were leaked documents. There have been requests and demands for access to know what's being negotiated, let alone to comment on it publicly, for a year and a half. So what are the sources of counterpower? One reason why I think so many of the arguments have focused on technical infrastructure in the domains where it matters has to do with the fact that when the technical infrastructure works in an open way, it's very hard, not impossible, but very hard for law to push back. The recording industry learned the hard way that you can try to put in digital rights management, you can try to get the Justice Department to go after college kids as criminals, um, but it's very, very hard. iTunes, surprisingly, is what succeeded in getting more of a legal market, not because of law, but because it was a well-integrated device plus system. It actually attacked the freedom to share and use the music with the same system that was maintaining that freedom, that is to say, a technical system, but a closed one. Um, the debates over net neutrality, the debates over deep packet inspection, they're all debates about whether there's a particular regulatory intervention that can keep the infrastructure open enough so that you can run. When I started writing for the first, uh, the first time on Spectrum Commons in 96, 97 on, on unlicensed wireless, the main reason that I did that was because I saw it as the only form of infrastructure that didn't require concentrated capital investment to create, where essentially each of our computers, using what we now know as Wi-Fi, this was before Wi-Fi was defined as, 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 as a standard, uh, could actually create our own wireless networks as a system of last resort to those that are better controlled. So the efforts to create technical platforms. Social, this is part of what I'll talk about tomorrow when I'll talk about different dimensions of power and how essentially what we saw, culture being interjected, culture being interjected as a system of counterpower against the anti-piracy uh, uh, campaign, supporting 
hackers who broke the systems with systems of, 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 of uh, asserting their, their attractiveness. And basically what you got was fans using culture and technology to push back on systems of technology and law efforts to constrain. But it's a battle. There's no, I, I don't know what the outcome will be. There are, uh, all, all I can say is we need to think strategically about which interventions in which system will be hardest to constrain using the other systems, in particular the systems of, of, of law. Yes, I'm, I'm a little concerned. When, when you're talking about um, as if there's this battle between these different systems, a lot of what you've been talking about here is not about only the battles between the two systems, but the co-optation or appropriation of for for profit measures of some of these systems, even if they were functioning the way that you're talking about. And you can see it in the FOSS community, you have the free software versus the open source camp, in which for some people it seems to be a system of only doing things more efficiently or doing them better, like a better source of profit. That I don't know, from that perspective, it seems to me it doesn't have a lot of transformative potential, which is, I think, one of the problems is what you're bringing out right here. And even, you know, you're using uh, a distribution that it's free software, but it's backed by a corporation whose president defines himself as a self-appointed benevolent dictator for life. And so what I'm wondering is, within those... Uh, you, you describe the Shuttleworth Foundation as a corporation? Well, I'm, I'm saying Canonical, which is the firm that's okay. then enrolling uh, Ubuntu. So I'm wondering what's happening, I mean, what is the transformative potential within the system, I'm assuming that we manage to keep it away from all of these other aspects that you were talking about a second ago. So let me ask what it means to be transformative and what it means to be subversive, and let me use specifically the question of free software versus open source software. Should I explain in three yeah. in three words? So uh, once upon a time, uh, 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 a hacker named Richard Stallman invented the idea of free software. And this was the basic idea that software ought to be free in the sense of free speech. Um, and it should come with a set of permissions, the permission to copy, the permission to uh, um, distribute, the permission to modify, and with a major constraint, which is if you modify and distribute, you have to hand it over under the same license. This is the GNU general public license. This is the concept that's sometimes called copyright. He called this approach free software. Around 19, not around, in January of 1998, <laughs> Uh, a bunch of people, um, um, among whom, for example, was Brian Bellendorf, who started the Apache program that I described to you early on, came together and said, we've had enough of this ideology. We don't like the idea of calling it free and talking about free and freedom. We would like to call it about just an efficient way of writing software, just a way of getting better software faster. So we'll invent a new name called open source software. And what you're describing is essentially this is a co-optation of this radically transformative model into a model that is convenient for, um, uh, uh, for a corporation. Now, they, uh, uh, what, what was Chou and Lai's answer when he was asked about uh, uh, what he thinks about the French Revolution? And his answer was too soon to tell. That's my answer about open source. Because if IBM had to contend with itself being aligned with the ideological framing of free software, it would have been very difficult for it to invest a billion bucks in free software development and, um, 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 and, and uh, push on that uh, model. It would have been very difficult for the President's Task Force on, on High Technology in 2000 to say that free software ought to be adopted for mission-critical platforms so as if you get more robust systems. So the question then becomes, where, who's co-opting whom? Right? Is, the, is, the, is the development of a non-radical interface to a radical transformation in the actual proprietary 
right? Because remember, open source and free software are the same institutionally. The actual practice of production is the same. The legal, the le right? It's still the Linux kernel, or it's still uh, uh, Apache, or they both fit under the definition of free software as opposed to open source software. These are ideological self-definitions of what counts as what. So whether at the end of the day what will happen is that the free software moment will be co-opted into normal capitalist production, or whether the free software model will have been wrapped as a capsule to be swallowed by the corporate structure and change its modes of production is just too soon to tell. I, I, I can tell you a story coherent based on the current evidence that in fact we're moving towards a world in which it's tamed and become part of normal corporate Then you look at the studies and you say that it's appropriate for a software engineer in a firm to say to a manager, I don't know if I can do that. I'll have to go and see if it's good for the kernel. And that's an appropriate answer of an employee to a manager who says, do this. And I say, I'll see whether it's good for the kernel. And if you force them to do it, then they lose credibility and you lose your ability to connect to the kernel. It becomes a little harder. If you find a situation where in 1984, IBM was part of the coalition to integrate patents and trade-related aspects of intellectual property into the WTO, which was the most aggressive and powerful patent expanding move because it tied intellectual property protection into the trade system with all of its uh, uh, balances. Whereas by the 2000s, IBM is part of the coalition that's a lot more cautious, that's trying to push for patent reform and, and, and ratcheting down um, uh, the expanse of patents. So, so it, 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 it's, it's not so clear. I don't know the answer, but I think you should think that you don't know it either. Um, one more question, and then I think we should wrap up the first session. Um, I, I just wanted to ask what you think about, what you think is the sort of prime mover here. So, so on the, with respect to these new cooperative systems, um, so, on the one hand, you cite all of these studies from economics and evolutionary biology about the human capacity for cooperation and that sort of thing, but that doesn't really explain why this stuff would happen now. You know, it, it seems to me like your um, explanation is rooted in the technical forces of production. Um. <clears throat> Prime movers are hard. Um, <clears throat> I would say that the role of technology in this particular transition has been to change the economic implications of a set of motivational and social um, um, of capabilities and affordances that were there all along and were more limited in the scope in, in, in the scope of their influence on what was considered to be the core of the economy. So when I say technology is what makes the difference now for online cooperation, it's not that technology causes cooperation. It's that, and this was the point about the radical decentralization of capital. And this was the point about amateurs with the automobiles versus the amateurs with Wikipedia. Um, there are certain things you can do as a practical matter without concentrating capital. And there are certain things you can't. For those things you need to concentrate capital, you need some form of getting it. You need a market-based firm. You need the state. You need a workers' cooperative. You need something that's a barrier to actually being able to collect it in order to be effective. It's much harder to have scaling anarchic systems grow into an, a, 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 an effective production system. Once, though, you live in certain parts of the world in which the basic means of production of some of the most advanced sectors in the economy are there in the population as what was initially understood as consumption goods, but in fact are production goods, or at least marketed as consumption goods, but ends up being production goods. That's the point at which capital, physical capital and financial capital no longer become a, a, a barrier 
to effective action. And the question becomes, can you then create the social uh, interaction with the activity? Now, the particular set of technologies also then developed very quickly into serving that social organization. But remember that the first piece of social software is the CC line on email. Right? Long before there's any social networks, there's a CC line on email. And people are using whatever few affordances they have to create those, these, these social connections and organizations to take advantage of this. So that's why I'm saying prime mover is hard. I'd say the particular perturbation of this particular moment that has enabled this particular transition is this. But when I start to do what I start to do in the second half of the talk, I'm actually denying that it's the prime move. Because I actually think that at that point, using what we learned from there, we can go back to systems that do require large-scale uh, capital and change the ideology that explains what is the best way of using that capital toward a more cooperative system, say, of labor relations. Not necessarily in the argument of this is more just, but, and this, is a, 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 and this is a move of a certain kind, back to the question of what kinds of moves are or are not transformative, what are or are not subversive, to place it in terms of science, in terms of effectiveness, in terms of innovation, as ways to explain to organizations that do organize around capital concentration that they need to structure themselves in response to these cooperative human systems elements. <coughs>